Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Dr. Melissa Naidu. I'm um, the Chief Medical Officer for NIB Health Funds and I'm also an AMAQ board member. And today I'm chatting with Dr. Dinesh Palapana, who was the first junior doctor in Queensland with um, quadriplegia, having suffered a severe spinal cord injury after a car accident in 2010, which was midway through his medical degree. This left him paralysed from the chest down but determined to finish medicine, Dinesh graduated in 2016 with several awards, including Junior Doctor of the Year in 2018 um, and Australian Order. Proving that disability does not equal dis does not equal inability. Sorry, Dinesh is a doctor, a lawyer, a researcher, a disability and diversity advocate, but also clearly an overachiever. <laughs> So welcome, Dinesh. First of all, I just wanted to congratulate you on your recent admission as a lawyer um, and also on being the Queensland State recipient of the Australian of the Year. What does this mean to you? Um, first of all, overachiever, that's uh, <laughs> something coming from you. Um, it's uh, on, uh, on Sunday, 31st of January, so just a couple of days. It's going to be 11 years since I had the accident, Wow. which is also on a Sunday, come to think of it. Mm. And um, the time has gone by and, you know, initially when it happened, I often used to think about it every year. I'm like, wow, it's been one year, it's been two years. But later, as life started rolling on, I stopped even remembering. But this year with uh, this milestone, I've really had the time to reflect on the journey that we've had. And um, I, I just uh, I feel very grateful yeah. Um, I feel very privileged and I feel very lucky to have had this journey and to be here today and to have had the people that I've had in my life that's helped me along the way, which includes you. Oh, thank so, you. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just a very reflective time and, yeah, I'm just, I'm just very grateful. Well, I think, you know, that's wonderfully put, Dinesh. And as you know, I've had my own health challenges and I think that they, that these things do influence you and I'm really interested to explore that as we talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing in disability advocacy on how you use your experiences, I guess, to sort of benefit the community and those around you as well. So one in five Australians identify themselves as having some sort of a physical impairment. Um, but there's less than 1% of medical students with a disability, which making, uh, make those living with a disability the lowest represented group in, med in the medical profession. So we could argue that society is moved by having doctors with real life experience. I know my experiences have certainly changed my practice um, as well and influenced the work that I do. Um, but I guess the challenge is about how do we get that representation in medicine as well. So medicine is highly competitive and I imagine for those living with a disability um, and aspiring to do medicine that it can be a harder journey than it is for those um, of their able-bodied pe um, peers. So can you share maybe a little bit about your story and some of the barriers you experienced on your journey to becoming a doctor? Mm. Um, yesterday, uh, one of my friends who uh, preceded me uh, and graduated from medical school after having Guillain-Barre syndrome and quadriplegia, we joined a um, phone call with the University of Melbourne, who is now putting through a medical student with quadriplegia. And it was a really nice phone call to have because it's, uh, you have this institution like the University of Melbourne who've taken it upon themselves mm -hmm. to think outside the box and to have the student go through and they were just asking us about different things, you know, things like a physical examination and how we make our practice um, efficient and safe and effective. So uh, that was a really nice moment because I think Harry Eamon, who is um, my friend, him and I both had a bit of time to think back and go, oh, wow, this, this has been really worthwhile and things are changing. Um, there are solutions to nearly everything. We use a lot of technology in practice anymore. Um, even things like a digital otoscope. I've, I've fiddled around with this otoscope where you can look at someone's ear and it comes up on a screen. Um, and that's pretty good for kids. You know, kids generally get distressed when you stick something yeah. in the ear. We can say, hey, let's have a look inside your ear. And you can even get your, the, their parents to help you with it. So those tools not only make medicine accessible, 
for someone like me who can't use their fingers. But it makes it a bit more efficient and sometimes better and yeah. less distressing for the patient. So there are a bunch of different ways that we can do things. There are a bunch of different workarounds that we can use. And uh, a lot of it, even things like voice recognition, it makes medicine a bit safer and more efficient. The biggest barriers that I've had and the biggest barriers that we continue to see, sadly, are attitudes. And we have policies. So Queensland Health has always had a policy about diversity and inclusion, for example. Um, we've got laws, we've got treaties, we've got conventions. And uh, even from the bottom up, we broadly support this message. But the, I think the barrier that we face is really that middle layer between all those things. And there's a lot of hesitancy among that middle layer to change things. And I think that's been the biggest challenge. It was the biggest challenge for me and it continues to be the biggest challenge for other people as well. So it's really attitudes among our colleagues and senior colleagues. Let me tell you that not a single patient has ever asked me about the injury. And every single patient that I've interacted with, it's been a positive experience from that perspective. Uh, so I think we need to start thinking about different attitudes. I think we just need to have an open mind and to give it a go. There have been a few senior colleagues who have either been an intern under or a medical student under who at the end of that time with them have said, you know, initially I was very concerned, but at the end, my mind about what medicine should be has changed. So I hope that going forward, that's the attitude that we'll all have. Oh, I think that's a wonderful thing to hope for. And I think you're right in that, um, you know, having policies is, is one thing, but it's how we implement it. And um, I'm taking from what you're saying as well, you know, that, thought about our unconscious biases as well. And I think those change really by being exposed to what you don't know or you haven't experienced. And there's another reason why I think it's so important to have that diversity and have a variety of people that we work with and represent, um, you know, doctors um, for those of us working in the health system and for patients, because as you said, clearly patients benefit from that um, experience. And just some of those workarounds that you were talking about seem, I'm sure would benefit many a junior doctor as well, as well as a senior doctor, but um, as you sort of learn and practice medicine better. So um, thank you for sharing that. And I guess some of the, the ways in which you've overcome those. Um, getting into medical school, obviously, is just one part of a journey, um, of a very long journey of becoming a doctor, really. Um, how do you think that medical schools and colleges can support doctors with disabilities through their education and training? Just kind of have an open mind, really. And you have to be open to problem solving and figure out different ways to do things. For me, for example, um, just as one example, uh, basic life support was one of the things we had to address. And it was uh, something that we had in the OSCEs as well. So how do we work around that? Well, I upskilled myself by doing an advanced cardiac life support course and therefore learning how to more uh, manage the resuscitation. And then for the purpose of the OSCE itself, uh, the idea was that I would instruct someone on the compressions. Actually, that, that can be a fairly bit more complicated skill because you have to tell them the depth of the compressions, the rate yeah. and whatever else. So I think as a doctor too, you probably want to be sitting back and intellectually thinking about what might be happening when, when someone's in a cardiac arrest. Uh, so we, we thought about that a bit differently and approached it a bit differently. We had an external observer um, from another university sitting in on the OSCEs and thinking about it. So you just have to think a bit laterally and think about how to work around situations, make something better even. Uh, while having integrity about the whole process. And not many of the colleges have policies in place around um, disability and inclusion. Um, do you think this is really important for moving forward? Yeah, I've had interactions with a couple of colleges and um, that's the College of Radiology and Emergency Medicine. And I have to say that those colleges have been very um, forward thinking uh, and they've been really good. And again, it, <laughs> It comes back to the employers because uh, while the colleges are an important part of it, um, 
there's a layer that's selecting the trainees and those are the employers and they still tend to be a tricky area to navigate sometimes. Yeah, and that brings me on to, I mean, you co-founded Doctors with Disabilities um, Australia, which provides advocacy and peer support to medical students on matters associated with both studying um, and for doctors with a disability. Um, and you've also worked closely with the AMA to create the first of kind, really, national policy policies for inclusivity in medical education and employment. How does Australia compare internationally? And why do you think this is such an important thing to, for you to be advocating for? I was, I was really, really happy um, to have the AMA support in bringing out these position statements because um, the AMA has always been a thought leader. You know, whenever there's, say, something in the press or people talk about the public talk about a medical topic. They say that, well, the AMA thinks this or the AMA does this. So to have the AMA say, we support a diverse workforce and we support training a diverse workforce. That's something that other professions, other industries and our community can quote. You know, they'll say, well, the AMA supports this, which, which has been done before, you know, to, to a broad range of important topics. So that was really good. Um, and Australia is actually starting starting to lead the way now. It's great to hear. It was a bit different from the conversation we had. A few I mean, years ago. Yeah, a few yeah. years ago, yeah. So a few years ago, it was a very different situation. Mm. But in a very short period of time, we managed to come leaps and bounds. So now we've been asked to provide input to, um, we've had, input in the UK, the US. Um, we've got conversations with colleagues from Europe, New Zealand. We've been able to uh, even give input to legal cases in countries like India, supporting countries like Sri Lanka. So across the world, people contact us and say, oh, how did you do this? What do you think of this? Will you provide a letter of support or whatever? So um, it's that, that's a pretty special thing. It's wonderful to hear. And I think, you know, you've clearly been really instrumental in driving this and opening people's eyes to the need for it. And um, I think it's wonderful to be able to sit here and, and talk to you a few years later and see that we've actually made this progress about things that we were kind of just, I guess, contemplating how you'd go about it, um, really, when we talked, um, I think it's probably about three, four years ago now. Um, so as you know, I too am very passionate about diversity and inclusion, um, and I'm a really strong believer in medical leadership. And that probably takes me to the next point, which I wanted to make is that I think also medical leadership really needs to reflect the diversity of the community in which we serve. Um, and I think that's how we actually solve some of the problems that we see in health and some of those really challenging issues. Um, so I think it needs to reflect gender, age, race, rurality. Um, but doctors with disabilities, clearly you are a leader um, and due to your personal experiences, I think bring positive attributes such as, you know, enhanced patient centeredness, a lived experience, um, compassion, empathy to your roles as future doctors. So how do we ensure that we can actually get a diversity of people into medical leadership? And how important do you think, I mean, you've played a role now, you've been a member of the AMA for five years. You've also been on the doctor, um, the Council of Doctors in Training and have used that, I guess, as a vehicle as well as um, many of your other endeavours to progress this issue around um, doctors with disabilities. How important do you think it is for doctors to step up into advocacy roles and play a role in leadership and for there to be a diversity in the doctors that do that? It's extremely important because... Um, the last year has particularly uh, highlighted the importance of having a diverse group of medical leaders in medicine. What we do is, I mean, I think sometimes we underestimate what we do because it's to look after the healthcare of our community and a nation. That's a pretty important thing. And to be able to do that properly, we need to have a deep understanding and reflect those people that are in our community. Um, so I think uh, having that diverse workforce is important. How we get there, I think there is a, a very complex 
set of opinions about how we increase diversity. And I don't know if there's a right answer, but... It's not necessarily just an easy thing, is it? There might exactly. be a suite of answers, yeah. But I think the a start is at least um, training a diverse group of people and giving them the opportunity to have a voice, um, which... Uh, Last year, um, I think one of the best examples, last year I had the opportunity to um, be a part of several important tables that were talking about the pandemic and how we deal um, with healthcare for people with disabilities during that pandemic. And that was a great thing. But I realized that much, much later, like a few months ago, that um, at those tables, there, were, there was no representation for rural Australians with disabilities. Mm. And there were so many missed things. Because I went, I went to rural Australia and had a chat to some people with disabilities there and they were saying, oh, there was X and Y and Z. And, you know, like we, for example, we were talking about um, arranging priority food delivery for people and Coles and Woolworths and a bunch of supermarkets and the NDIS got together and made that possible. But for some of these people, there is no calls or Woolworths and mm. uh, NDIS access is sketchy. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it is really important to have those voices at the table at least. Mm. Um, and that's what we need to, at the very least, start being able to do. I was very lucky to be on the Council of Doctors in, in training because there, then we were able to say, okay, here, here's a voice from someone who has a disability. So um, I, th I think that highlights the importance of that. Yeah, and look, I think it's um, so important. I started my sort of involvement with the AMA um, in the Council of Doctors in Training as well, and I think that doctors in training have such an important voice um, to contribute to and are such important leaders as well. Um, you preempted my next question a little bit there, talking about the pandemic, because I know that, um, you know, the value of a diverse medical work workforce and ensuring that the medical profession is representative of the varied community is really important. And then at the end of the day, benefits patients and the community to have those voices. Um, but it's also a worldwide equity concern. And we've really seen a number of things change through COVID. Um, I'm really interested to learn a little bit about how COVID has impacted you. I know we've had a couple of conversations, so I've got a little bit of insight, but, um, you know, how did it impact you personally? And I know professionally mm. as well um, with your role, there were some changes that you had to make. Yeah, well, the biggest thing is, um, personally, my lung function is very suboptimal uh, and the spinal cord injury creates a whole host of other risks. Uh, even if I say contracted COVID and was having a reasonably good course, um, how do I stay isolated from my caregivers and the daily routine that I have and whatever else? You, you'd be forced into a hospital yeah. um, and you could potentially get complications from you know, missing your usual day-to-day -day stuff. So there, there are a lot of things like that that we thought thought about, um, and it was scary. And there was a lot of other people in the community with disabilities that were terrified. Um, and uh, so there, there was there was an added level of fear, I think. But um, that's just life, and. I chose my career as a doctor and I, I love it. And I think this is a part of just what we have to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, this was our time to step up. But um, I was, uh, for a period of time, I was um, asked to move away from the ED um, and work with um, some of the medical executive in our hospital, um, which actually turned out to be an amazing thing. I learned a lot about how they managed the pandemic at that level, how they manage staff and shuffling people around, getting to get to the right place. Um, you kind of realize that there are some high level, big picture things that are really important. So that was, that was good. But I always want to, I want to stay um, medical and I want to stay um, 
near the front, near the tip of the sword, because it's just what I love doing and it's it, it's my purpose, I think. And I always, I know whenever I talk to you, I always see that passion come out in you when you talk about that. And, um, uh, you know, I'm always trying to encourage um, people like yourself and, and, and those with natural leadership abilities, but wanting to make a change and advocate um, into medical administration. But I actually think every doctor having an understanding of those systems and how the health system works, how hospitals works is really important and benefits your day to day. So um, it's wonderful. I hope that we will see you maybe one day combining a little bit of that. But um, I think also it just demonstrates how important it is to have those voices because talking about the impact on someone with disability when we're dealing with an issue like COVID is so important to have in the narrative as we're planning um, how you deal with the pandemic and how you provide health delivery in a way that meets people's and the community's needs as well. So I think that's a great um, a, a great way to sort of show the depth that you can bring from your own personal experience. Well, that's the thing. I mean, we, I, was, uh, I mentioned some of the tables that we had during the pandemic about um, managing the healthcare needs of people with disabilities with coronavirus was there a doctor with a disability on that table it was just me sometimes <laughs> and uh that that's also a pretty scary thing you know we, it would have been nice to have a diverse group of doctors there as well so that probably leads me to um a good question to kind of finish up on and, and i know we've got a few people tuned in so um certainly if there's any questions you can pop them up in the chat and we'll try to um, run through them um, but how do we foster a more inclusive culture so that we can get the right people with the right voices around? Yeah, it's attitudes. It's really attitudes. Uh, I was really lucky, um, you know, when I, when I was going through the early parts of my journey and having some struggles, I had people like you, um, Dr. Alex Markwell, Dr. Shahina Braganza, um, and a host of other um, doctors and community leaders and the community and academics and everyone supporting it. Um, so if you believe in it, I think you have to fight for people and fight for what's right. There's great value in a grassroots movement. And I feel that I, I had the benefit of that. So you need to be, able, you need to fight for people and change, change attitudes. It just takes one at a time and then it eventually snowballs into something else. Um, so I think all of us, we should try and have an open mind and fight for what's right and just step up for people. It's not about the laws and the structures and the policies and whatever else. We just need to fight for each other and fight for what's right and bring it up. Um, and just have an open mind, you know, don't, don't just think about what won't work. Um, just think about the possibilities, how to make it work say yes rather than no. I think that's such a great, um, great message. And it's been an absolute pleasure um, for me, I guess, to see all the things that you've achieved over the last five years that we've known each other. Um, and particularly with that attitude of, of saying yes and taking opportunities and standing up and, and being an advocate. And, um, you know, I think I, I started out meeting you thinking that I was going to play a bit of a mentorship role, but I think that our relationship certainly turned into one of a bit of reverse mentorship. So I think I've certainly learned a lot from you and um, my mind's opened up as well. And wow. so I thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for working with AMA um, and AMA Queensland and also all the other work you do, I think, that advocates for um, our colleagues but also for patients and the community and the healthcare that we deliver. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. I don't know if we've got any questions on the chat. We don't. Last chance for anyone to get in if they've got a burning question um, for Dinesh. I don't know, Dinesh, if there's anything else that you'd like to touch on? Uh, not off the top of my head. Not off the top think, of yeah. your head. You're doing some exciting research. Um, the spinal moment, which research. I also yeah. am privileged to be involved in the steering committee for. Well, I think that's another um, super important thing that we need to get involved in as doctors. Mm -hmm. so in the research community, there's actually quite a, quite a lack of clinical uh, people. And that just adds a very important dimension to research. My dream is to be able to stand up one day and talk to you here. 
Um, and that's a, that's the very selfish motivation behind the spinal cord research. But um, I'd love to see more doctors actually driving some of this. Well, I think that very selfish motivation, which I don't think is selfish at all, will benefit a lot of people. So there are a few burning questions here. Um, any advice for those who have other issues that they want to rally people together and help make change? Um, yes. Uh, I think um, you just, having, having a tribe is really important as well. Um, having some like-minded people, mm -hmm. um, what, whatever your cause is or whatever the issue is, there are probably many people out there that, that have the same issue and that are passionate to change that. Um, but someone's also, someone has to do it. Yeah. Um, we might wait for someone else to do it. So if you do have an issue and if you do have a cause, it might need to be you that want, that sparks the fire yeah. and then people will follow, particularly if you have passion. Definitely. I could not agree more. Um, what would you like the AM, AMAQ to do next? I think the AMAQ has been amazing so far. There's still a bit of work to be done. And I think the big one is really um, holding employers accountable. That's where a lot of the barriers that I had came from. And it's where uh, there are still barriers and we hear about it all the time. So, um, you know, there's the carrot and the stick. Um, and I think sometimes uh, maybe we just need to drive that stick a bit more. Um, I've got one last question it looks like here. Do you have any suggestions as to how people with disabilities such as epilepsy can engage? That's a great question. I think, um, I think you have to ask those people because there are so many complexities with the spinal cord injury that um, a lot of people, even in medicine, don't really know about. For example, I can't really regulate my own temperature, which is why I'm wearing a jumper on a summer day because I will, I will get cold at some point. Um, there are all these complications that can happen in at the flick of a switch. So, and there there are some intricacies. Um, so that there's a lot of depth to it. Um, but I think just going out there and um, talking to people and asking what these things are, that, that, would, be, um, that would be an important thing. Um, oh, join just in time for questions. Uh, what is Dr. Dinesh's take on the application of brain computer interfaces to facilitate spinal cord oh, injury recovery? Yeah, we're, we're doing question. So that, that's exactly what we're doing in our yeah. research lab. We work with brain computer interfaces. And um, what we are doing is using EEGs and um, electrical stimulation and um, rehabilitation to reorganize the spinal cord. And we've seen that to work in some of the early trials that have been done in the US in particular. So there's huge um, application in that. And I'm actually pilot testing a lot of things in our lab. Um, and that has been shown to actually have amazing results in some of the early trials. So um, it's definitely an area that we're working on ourselves. Exciting. What was your motivation behind becoming a lawyer as well as a doctor? Um, so I went to law school before I studied medicine, but I never got admitted as a lawyer. And there's a component like a internship that you have to do. There's a bit of coursework. You got to do time with a lawyer or a law firm. So I never did that. I just went straight to med um, because law was very boring <laughs> back then <laughs> um, for me anyway. Uh, but after I went through this experience, I realized that law is a very powerful thing to create change, but to also fight for people. Mm. And so I went back and um, finished it off and became admitted as a lawyer to do that. And it's really useful because you can fight for people. Yeah. Um, so what's next for you? What do you think? Do you have any major goals this year? Or what yeah. are you looking forward to? Uh, the spinal cord work yeah. is my biggest thing. That's like the big blue sky, big picture stuff. Um, and uh, 
continue to work as a doctor, there's still a lot of work to be done in disability. Yes. Um, one of the really exciting things that I just had a conversation about before I came here today is about equitable um, access for rural Australians with disabilities, mm-hmm. some huge gaps there. Um, so there'll be work in those areas that I'm doing as well. Fantastic. Well, wishing you all the best. I have no doubt at all, um, Dinesh, that you'll continue to achieve um, and inspire people and make change. Um, You're certainly inspiring to me. And thank you for having a chat with us today. I don't think we've got any more questions. Thanks for tuning in. (laughs) Thanks very much, everyone.